welcome you to this meeting of the Temple Baptist Church. God bless you for being here. A number of friends visiting with us, and it's not always a delight. And we welcome the friends who are watching as we live stream the meetings on faithforthefamily.com and templebaptistchurch.com. And of course, as always, we're so glad we can broadcast services live by means of radio and have a lot of folks listening and watching and praying for us. I want you to stand with us, please. We're going to ask God's blessing on our meeting. I believe that's where we ought to begin. What a difference when Jesus passes by. If he's passed by your life, you know what they're singing about, don't you? He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ever ask or even think. We give him glory for that. Our evangelist friend, Dr. Brown, preached a powerful message on this morning and put himself on the spot for this evening, doesn't he? We're expecting great things. <laughs> I want you to pray for him. He's a warm-hearted Christian and a great encourager to me. And I appreciate him and his wife and their loyalty to the Lord. Let's pray together, may we? Our fathers, we come to thee, we thank thee, Lord, that we have this high holy privilege to come on the merit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to speak with thee, the only true and living God. And we ask for thy blessings on this meeting as we've come together to worship thee, lift thy name high in this place. May all eyes be on thee. May we look to thee for all we need. We pray for those who do not know thee as Savior, that this will be the hour, the glad hour, when they come clean with thee, seek thy forgiveness of sin and the salvation that comes in Christ, in Christ alone. Lord, please save the lost. And we pray for those of us who are thy children, for the mighty work of thy spirit be done in our lives. We know the need is great, the labors are too few. So we pray to thee, the Lord of the harvest, that you would send forth laborers into your harvest. Bless our brother who's visiting with us to preach your word. May he know your power and blessing in his preaching in this hour. And for all that's accomplished, we'll give thee glory. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. While you're standing, I want you to take our crown hymn book and turn to hymn number 263. He's a wonderful Savior to me. I love to hear you sing that. Hymn number 263 is Brother John comes to lead us. Let's do our best.
so much. You may be seated, and we're very happy to have our Temple Baptist Church Young Adult Ensemble singing, and let's pray for them as they sing now. Thank you so much. And we'd love to invite you all to stand. And let's turn in our hymnals to hymn number 366, please. Hymn number 366, a wonderful hymn. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. He lifted me.
Thank you. You may be seated. Wonderful singing. We're going to look at the bulletin together. If you need a copy, would you raise your hand, please? And our men are coming your way to bring one to you. And we'll share some prayer requests in a moment. I hope you'll take a pen out and be ready to write those down. Uh, first, a few notes to pass along. A happy birthday to Cassie Cox, who celebrated just a few days ago. And a happy 57th wedding anniversary to Roger and Jackie Couch. So may God bless them and a special congratulations to them. We have a number of folks visiting tonight, and among them, uh, Pastor Derek Dewey and a group from the Faith Baptist Church out in Meeker, Colorado. And thank you for being here with us tonight. And also the Hofferts are here from Washington, Iowa, and we appreciate them and many others being with us. We'll have a special way of recognizing our guests just a little later. Let me share some prayer requests and ask you to write them down, if you would, please. Uh, first, we're continuing to pray for Darren and Corey Williams, and we're congratulating them on the birth of their daughter, Kaylee Joy, who was born last Thursday, and we thank God for this blessing, and please continue to pray for them. Uh, we're praying for Becky Newport and the homegoing of her mother, Lois Lohman, and let's please lift this family up to the Lord tonight. We're also praying for Wanda Rogers and the homegoing of her husband, Charles Rogers, and uh, Mrs. Sexton, of course, and the homegoing of her brother, Charles. The family is receiving friends this coming Thursday from noon to 3 p.m. at the Forest Hill Baptist Church in Maryville with the memorial service to follow. And we'll have that information on our prayer list as well throughout the week. But please pray for Mrs. Sexton's family members. We're also praying for Diane Clark and the homegoing of her husband, Curtis Clark. And he, he was Mrs. Sexton's cousin. And so please continue to pray for family there. Please pray for Carol Huang, who has a very serious surgery schedule for this Tuesday, and we're praying for success in that. Pray for Robin Owens, Tim Owens' wife, who's been diagnosed with cancer. Pray for Susan Fisk, Rhonda Sexton's mother, who's very ill with cancer. Pray for Jesse McBride and Norma Jean Griffith, who are battling cancer. And then a very special prayer need as we go to the Lord tonight. Pray for Stephen Palmer. This is son of uh, Chad Palmer. And uh, the Palmers assist and have been connected to the work out at the Passage in Montana and, and live very close to there and they're dear friends. And Stephen, their son, has been seriously injured in a motorcycle accident and he's having emergency surgery right now. And so would you please lift him up to the Lord and let's pray that God will help these surgeons and undertake for Stephen as he's in that surgery even this very moment. We'll ask Brother Tim Cart to come and lead us in prayer. And let's all bow our hearts to the Lord and ask God to intervene for these dear ones. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we are grateful that you have passed by us. Lord, thank you for salvation. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, we have access and privilege because of the merits of Christ. Lord, we know that we can come before thee in this hour and bring these petitions to you and that you hear. And Lord, there is grace to help. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you do pass by in this service this evening. Lord, we pray that you would pass by for salvation, uh, pass by that there would be cleansing and forgiveness of sin, and pass by, Lord, send forth laborers from this service this evening. Lord, we look to thee. Lord, we need thee. We ask you, Lord, to work in your grace and mercy among us. Lord, we pray for Brother Brown as he preaches this evening. Fill him with your power and use him mightily, we ask. Do your work in our hearts. Help us to be alert and attentive, sensitive to the working of your Holy Spirit. We look to thee, Lord, for the revival we most desperately need. May we have great concern, Lord, for our own homes and hearts and uh, our own church here, our nation, Lord, because we desire that you would work, Lord, as people have turned their back on your word. And Father, we pray for these that are in need of comfort and peace and help because of illness and and the home going of their loved ones. Lord, meet their need in this hour as they look to thee. Lord, we pray, uh, Lord, for uh, the Newport family, the Lowman family, the Rogers family, and the Sexton family, and the Clark family, Lord, that you would strengthen and comfort them in these days of the home going of their loved ones. And Lord, we're just so thankful to be reminded that heaven is real, and we're thankful for that, that uh, we can have great confidence in thee. And Father, bless these families. Lord, we pray for... Uh, Carol Wong and her surgery that is coming up 
And for these that have cancer, Lord, we ask that you would continue to help them and their families, strengthen them as they look to thee, Lord, uh, meet them and visit them in this, in, in this hour. Lord, we ask, we pray for Robin Owens and Susan Fisk. We pray for Jesse McBride and Norma Jean Griffith, Lord. Pray that you would help them and strengthen them. Lord, we also are thankful for the birth of Kaylee Joy and the Williams family, Lord. Continue your blessings upon them, and we'll praise you for that. And Lord, we do ask especially for Stephen in this hour in his surgery. Be with the physicians that are ministering to him. Help them, Lord. Give them wisdom. Lord, we just pray that uh, you would just work mightily. Lord, I pray that this surgery and procedures would be successful. And Lord, that he would recover. Lord, be with his family. Lord, strengthen them. Thank you, God, again for your grace and mercy that we can look to thee and you can meet the need. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's keep praying. Well, our choir is singing now along with Brother Nathan Vanderford, and let's listen carefully and pray for them as they sing about the unseen hand. <laughs>
amen. I want you to look with me, please, at the bulletin just for a moment and to pray for the meeting on this Wednesday evening that the Lord will do a mighty work in our midst. In preparation for that, if you read Jeremiah chapter 8, when will God's people blush? The Bible says they lost their blush. What caused that? I say sometimes God's people get so accustomed to sin that they lose the shock of it all. And we don't want that to happen. We're having things like that in our own country. And we're praying and asking God to guide us and help us. So please be prepared in your heart to come and ask the Lord to do a mighty work. I want you to find hymn number 362. We'll sing in just a moment. Among all the friends who are visiting with us, we have some dear folks who work diligently getting out gospel literature around the world and the, the Bible Literature Missionary Foundation and the Lamont's people. We're glad you're here. And, uh, you know, I knew your dad so well. He's with Jesus now, but we always refer to you Bobby. But I, I see you've got Robert Jr. here, but we want to get it right. We've got a beautiful family. Glad you're with us. Any way we can help you, we want to try to do that. Other friends who are visiting with us, we're happy you're here. God bless you. There's no place like this place anywhere near this place. So praise God, this must be the place. And I'm glad you're come to be a part of it. And if you're visiting with us, we want you to remain seated. And all the folks who call the Temple Baptist Church your church home, I want you to stand and let's sing it. When we get to the chorus on this song, if it's not in your heart, don't even try to sing it. But uh, Brother John, lead us in it. Mine, mine, mine. So let's see if you've got it. Let's sing it to the glory of God. If you got it there, hymn number 362. Dear Savior, thou art mine. Let's sing it out now. Dear Savior, thou art mine.
receive the offering, I'd like to ask Pastor Derek Dewey, if you would, to come and lead us in prayer in just a moment for the offering. For the offertory this evening, Jonathan Hibbard will be playing hymn number six, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. If you'd like to turn to hymn number six and worship along with the words, we'd welcome you to do that. Many people give online, and there's a very safe way to do that. If you go to the Temple Baptist Church website, you'll find there a secure link where you can give online, and it's safe, and so we'd encourage you to do that. Many give here in person in the auditorium, but perhaps you're watching or listening this evening, and you'd like to give online. We'd welcome you to do that. Let's be faithful. God is always so gracious and good and kind and faithful to us, and this is a way we have to express our worship to him in our giving, our tithes and offerings. So let's pray together. We're grateful to have Pastor Dewey and a group of folks from out in Meeker, Colorado here visiting with us tonight. He's a Crown College graduate. We're grateful he's here. Come and lead us in prayer. Lord, we want to thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be in your house tonight. Uh, we're so grateful, Lord, that you've given us the heritage to be able to stand in this place and be able to hear the great preaching of your word. We ask, Father, that you'd bless this service, that your will and your word would be preached. And, Father, that you'd take this offering and use it for your glory. Father, that we'd be able to use what you've given us to further the kingdom of Christ. And we give you all the praise and the glory, uh, Lord, that you deserve. And for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we were in for a great blessing earlier in the day and Brother Brown's message. So many people have said to me, they got some things settled with God and that's wonderful, isn't it? And I told him, our people need to hear a fresh voice from time to time. I've tried through the years, but I happen to know from being in this all these years that God uses certain people from time to time in your life and mine and uh, we're just praising God when he does. So grateful to the Lord. And Brother Brown is a long, long time preacher of the gospel, pastor for more than 40 years, one church he started, and then in evangelism. And uh, he and I have been knowing one another for a long time. His son is with us from time to time and he's always a blessing. 
And I said to Larry earlier in the day, Joseph is such a blessing when he preaches. And he's a lot like his daddy when he's preaching. And I'm so thankful for that. I want you to be praying, have your Bible ready, allow the Lord to speak to your heart. And then this group of young men coming to sing before Larry comes to preach. My hope is in the blood. God bless you, fellas, as you sing. Every hope that I have here in this old sinful world is anchored in the blood of the Lamb. Though the billows are raging and we're tossed to and fro, there's peace beneath that blow. My hope is in the blood of the precious Lamb of God. joy of knowing Jesus will vanish all my fear, for he took away destiny. My hope is in the blood of the precious Lamb of God. There is no other fountain so fountain so sweet. It has washed away my sin, gave me peace and joy within. My hope Thank you. That was a blessing. Take your Bibles and turn quickly to 1 Kings chapter 17, please. 1 Kings chapter 17. And you buckle your seatbelt. We're going for a ride. I'm excited tonight. How many are excited to be in God's house tonight? Isn't it a wonderful thing? I've enjoyed spending time with Dr. Sexton and his wife. We had lunch together. I call it dinner. <clears throat> I'm from the South. It's dinner in the middle of the day and supper at the end of the day. But anyway, we had a wonderful time together, and through the years, we have enjoyed their fellowship, and uh, as he said, we go way, way back, and I praise the Lord for the fellowship that we've had. I always try to get to know the pastor and his wife when I come into a church. I had a good preacher friend. He's now in heaven, Brother Carl Lackey at the White Plains Baptist Church, Mount Airy, North Carolina, and he was preaching in a church that I had been in before. He was holding a revival there. He had been at this church before, but he had never been with this particular pastor before, and he's sitting on the platform, and the opening night of the meeting, <clears throat> it was a Monday through Friday meeting, the opening night of the meeting, uh, a blonde-headed woman sat on the front row and hollered, Amen, louder than any of the men. And it was a shouting church. I mean, it was a camp meeting style church. And she hollered amen louder than any of the men. I mean, it, it was such a shrill amen. It would just raise the hair on your arms, you know. And uh, so it went on through. They had more face, face paint on than Tammy Faye Baker, you know. And I mean, really, that, that's a lot, you know. But anyway, they... Um, so, so the second night of the meeting, Brother Carl was sitting beside the pastor and this same woman came in the back, walked across. It was a prelude. They were playing, getting ready for the service. And as she started across the back, Carl leaned over to his pastor friend and said, Pastor, do you see that woman in coming in back yonder? He said, yeah, I see her. He said, Preacher, I want to tell you something. You better keep your eye on that woman. That woman's going to give you trouble. And it was the pastor's wife. <laughs> What would you do? 
<laughs> Another, pa I didn't know this other pastor, but he was sitting on the platform and he was cutting up a little. And uh, he said, hey, preacher, you see that woman fourth pew from the back and third one in with that purple dress? He said, yeah. He said, that's the ugliest woman I ever saw in my life. And the pastor said, that's my wife. He tried to lie out of it. He said, I don't mean her. I mean the one sitting beside her. He said, that's my daughter. And sometimes you get in more trouble. One time I said, well, you're from Baltimore, the home of great soccer players and ugly women. He said, my wife was from Baltimore. He said, what team did she play on? I need to know. <laughs> well, I'm excited tonight. Would you please forgive me for having fun in church? It's the only place I go. If I didn't have fun in church, I wouldn't have fun anywhere. I don't go anywhere but church and motel rooms. That's all I go. But I take my sweetheart with me everywhere I go, and we have a continual party. The honeymoon is still on. And we're having the time of our lives, and I praise the Lord for that. Uh, glad to have the Hoffords here from our church tonight. We got a prospective student there, and uh, he'll be looking the college over tomorrow, as well as several new prospective students here. And I'll be preaching to you in the morning in the chapel, and we'll have a good time. You can believe that when I tell you. Did I turn, tell you to turn to 1 Kings 17? Is that what I said? Well, some, sometimes I've been mistaken. Sometimes you'll think you tell people to turn one place and, and then you told them to turn somewhere. I have read things I thought was in one place, but I was reading out of another place. And an old country boy from up the hills of North Carolina, uh, he was one of them uh, old-fashioned wind-sucking preachers. I love that kind of preaching. I was raised on it all my life. And boy, I mean, uh, uh, he was gaffing. He, he hadn't even had his opening prayer. He was just reading his text in the book of Genesis. And here's what he read. And the Lord made her to me. And he turned the page. Well, he thought he turned the page. They were stuck together. Here's what he actually read. And the Lord made her to me. 175 cubits long, 100 cubits wide. 50 cubits tall in the window in the top thereof. He stared at it for a moment. He looked up and said, she's a big one, was she, boys? I'm telling you, she was. We preachers get all whoppy jawed. I'm excited tonight. Can you tell I'm just ready to run all over this auditorium? I'm about as excited as that old boy when he got married. I'm telling you, he was nervous as a tomcat in a room full of rocking chairs. And when the preacher said, I now pronounce you man and wife, he kissed the preacher, gave his wife $50, and left with his mama. He was excited. <laughs> And I'm excited tonight. I'm open to 1 Kings chapter 17, and we'll begin reading in verse number 2. Hey, everybody, stand up. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse number 2. And, start, and the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, talking about Elijah now. Get thee hence and turn thee westward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. If you mark in your Bible, and I highly suggest that you do, I, I would like to ask you to take a pen or a pencil right now if you can reach and get one and circle that word there. Just circle it. I have com commanded the ravens to feed thee there. And so he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. And it came to pass after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. There it is again. Circle that word there again. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there, circle it again, to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there. Circle the word there. A gathering of sticks, and he called unto her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And she did just that, and God sustained the man of God. That little word there is the secret to this whole passage. God had a place that he wanted Elijah. It was there. And I want to bring you a message tonight entitled, Are You There? 
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, how wonderful to be under the spout where the glory comes out. How wonderful, Lord, to be among God's people. How wonderful to fellowship again with Dr. Sexton and his faithful wife. And Lord, how wonderful to be in this great church with so many of God's people. How wonderful to hear this wonderful choir sing and the special music. How wonderful to feel the liberty that the Holy Spirit of God can give. And I pray, Lord Jesus, now tonight, you'll do wonderful and great things. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. You may be seated. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah, and he says, You go down by the brook Cherith, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, here's, here's the message. The message is this. God had a place where Elijah was going to eat in a famine. Others would starve to death. But Elijah had a place, a there, that God wanted him at. And there was good news here. And that is God had a place of substance. And here's what he said. He said, now you go down there, and when you get there, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, here's what he didn't say. He didn't say, I'm going to meet your needs where you are. God doesn't meet our needs where we are. He meets our needs where we need to be. And another thing, this will, this will surprise you, God didn't put him there and then say, okay, ravens, I got him here. Now, won't you come and feed him? No. He said, I've already pre-programmed the ravens to feed you there. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Now, Elijah, you don't have to go there. You can go over here if you want to. I mean, you're a free moral agent. God does not command and push his children in directions that they're not willing to go. He gives them leadership, and if they're not willing to follow, they have to pay the price thereof. But God says, I've got a place over here where you can eat. And you don't have to go there, but if you're going to eat, you're going to eat here. And God doesn't put the ravens there and then uh, put you there. He, he has pre-programmed the blessings of God in your life. It is not where you are, but it's where God would have you be, the perfect will of God. And, uh, and, so, and not only that, but here's what he said. Finally, the brook dries up. In verse number 8, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zion, and dwell there. Now, Watch what he says here. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. He didn't say, now if you'll go over there, I'll make sure and take care of your needs. And when he got him over there, he said, now, uh, widow woman, I'm going to lead you over here to feed this man. No, the widow woman had already been commanded to feed him there. And when he got there, according to the scriptures, she was preparing the meal. So in other words, God has a there for you and everything you need in this life, everything God wants to provide for you, every safety, every blessing, every leadership, every uh, endowment from heaven is there and you don't have to go there. But if you don't go there, you'll miss all God has for you there and he's not going to move those blessings around and follow you. He's going to have those blessings where he wants you. And he leads you to the blessings. And boy, once you get a hold, notice here, Luke 4, 25. But I tell you of a truth, many widows in Israel were in Israel in the days of Elias. But unto none of them was Elias sent, unto Sarah, but unto Sarah, a city of Zidon, unto a woman that was a widow. He was sent over there to be fed. He was sent over there for God to bless him. There are people all over this room, no doubt, that are suffering because you're not in the perfect there of your life. God has a place of blessing and provision. It could be... Uh, a, t a place location-wise, geographic. It could be a spiritual place he wants to bring you to, but God has a place. And if he can get you in that place, uh, he already has programmed the blessings of God to be in that place. I think about Ruth when she answered the will of God and followed her mother-in-law back to the land of Bethlehem, the land of bread. And when she got back there, her hap was to light on a field belonging to a prince charming Boaz. And the Bible says in verse 8, she's told, go not in any other place. 
This is the place where God had designed for everything she needed, the husband she needed, the feeding she needed, the sustenance she needed. And then in verse 16, God began to, through this Prince Charming throw down hands full on purpose. God has a there for all of us tonight. And so are you there? Number two, is your family there? Is your family there? In Genesis 35, we learn about Jacob. And here's what it says. It says, and God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto God that appeareth unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And Jacob said unto this household and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean and change your garments and let, let us arise and go up to Bethel. I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. He found when he came to that altar that God had designed for him and built that altar and worshiped God, he went everywhere else looking for that there and he never found it and he, and he wandered far from home and he, he lost everything there is precious to live for and God kept calling him back there and the there. You know, uh, I remember so clearly when my father moved to Winston-Salem and I was just a teenager and, uh, and he moved to Winston-Salem and brought my sister, it was only two of us, and he started looking for a church. We had attended a good independent Baptist church in Reesville, North Carolina, where we lived. And I had been attending uh, the Woodland Baptist Church north of Winston-Salem and I loved it. Oh, it's a big church. The choir would lift you through the roof, and I loved it. So I said, Dad, the first stop I want you to make is the Woodland Baptist Church. He said, all right. As a matter of fact, I've got a son-in-law as assistant pastor there now. Zeno Gross was a pastor in those days. But anyway, so we went out to Woodland, and Daddy enjoyed it. Mom enjoyed it. He said, but I want to look around a little bit. We went down South Park Baptist Church on South Main Street. We attended the Salem Baptist Church there uh, on South Broad Street. And then we went out to the Gospel Light Baptist Church there out at Walkertown. Uh, we'd heard about that, seven miles out of town. And we visited these churches. And I remember my dad sitting down, and he says, well, I'll tell you what. He's talking to my mother and talking to my sister and I. He said, they're all good preachers. But he said, you know, he said, some way, somehow, I wonder if we wouldn't be best to go out to the Gospel Light Baptist Church and join that church. Uh, he said, and this is what he said. He said, I know that fellow looks and sounds a whole lot like Tennessee Ernie Ford. But he said, you know, he's a, he's a, he's a spirit-filled man, a godly man. And he said, some way, somehow, I just feel, and I was disappointed. I really believe that if I'd have said, Dad, I'm driving now. I have my own car. Do you really care if I drive out to Woodland? And my daddy said, which was a great church also, but, and I really believe my daddy said, well, son, I'd rather be together, but if that's what you want to do, you can do it. But I had enough respect for my daddy. I had enough respect to the leadership God had given him. I was defeated about it, kind of, but I went on out at Gospel Light. I was 18 years old, and... Before I, turned, before I turned out of 19 into 20, Brother Bobby Robertson asked me to be his assistant pastor. I was, with him, I was his first assistant. I was with him seven and a half years. It was there God opened that great door of service for me. It was there I met the wife that, that uh, was the perfect will of God for my life. It was there that I met Dr. Wally Beebe who recommended me to four men and their wives that wanted to start a church in Washington, Iowa. It was there that God stirred me about the will of God and serving the Lord and put me in some, some nationwide evangelism. Everything in the world that ever happened in my life was because my family was in the there. And I'll tell you something. I say this to young people all over this building. In many cases, in many ways, and many times, you may be smarter than your parents. And we won't argue about that. But I'm going to tell you because they are your mom and dad, God is going to speak 
to them in a unique way about the direction of the family, which includes you. And if you're real smart and if you respect Bible and parental authority, your ears will be open and your heart will be attentive to the way your father and your mother feel led. And I'll tell you, I've done told you something now. You, you better listen to it. I've done told you. I'm thinking, now, is your family there? Is your family there? I'm thinking of a young man who was my youth director years ago. He was working secular job and uh, part-time there, my youth director. And he came to me one day. He was doing well, had three little children. He came to me and he said, uh, Pastor, they're going to move me. I said, where are they going to move you? He said, well, it's my company. They're going to move me up in the northern part of the state somewhere. I said, there's a good church up there? He said, well, they say there is. That's not going to cut it, friend. That's not going to cut it. And I said, I said, well, boy, you better be careful about getting out of the will of God. A couple of years later, he called me crying. He said, one of my daughters is expecting out of wedlock. I never dreamed one of my children. You know what? The, that child's contemporaries, all of them were doing well. None of them had a problem. You know, you better be careful about taking your family out of the there that God has given you. I'm thinking now, Keith Gomez told me this story. He said, you know, I was on Monday. He told me this within the last six months. He said, on a Monday morning, I was there at the church, and I heard this awful wailing. Got a, running hundreds in his church. He said, I heard this awful wailing. And I thought, what in the world? No, I didn't know there was anybody in the church but me that time of morning. And he said, I went out, and I looked down that beautiful foyer, and there was a man sitting on a bench, and he had children's shoes in his hand. And he was wailing. Oh, God, he said, I'm telling you, the man was wailing. And he said, I, as I walked up, he looked up at me, tears streaming. He said, you tried to tell me, you tried to tell me. What had happened was he had missed church that morning, the day before. He had been in church for several months. He had recently been saved. And he had left behind some things when he got saved. And some old buddies came by and called him, said, let's go fishing in the morning. And he went with them. Uh, and I think it was Lake Michigan, went out to the lake. And while out there, his little boy got caught in the undertow and drowned. And he said, you know, he said, you tried to warn me. You tried to tell me it's dangerous not to be in the will of God. It's dangerous to miss God's house. It's dangerous to miss God's will. Are you there? Is your family there? Is your family there? Uh, I'm, I'm stood over the casket of a lady whose husband had drowned it. And she said, we got to where we'd go down to the beach in the, on the weekends. And said, we knew we didn't belong down there. We knew we needed to be in God's house. We knew that was our place. But, you know, we justified it in saying we work all week, we need some time off, need to be with the family. And was down there, they were waiting, and he got caught and drowned. And I stood there over the casket with her as she wept. And she said, if we had been where we're supposed to be, it would have never happened. We should have been in church. There's nothing wrong with going on vacation. There's nothing wrong with missing this church, if you're a member of this church, occasionally to be off somewhere on a vacation. But you better not take a vacation on God. You better be in the there that God wants you to be. You know, David had an explosion happen in his family, a horrible thing. He had a baby that died. Amnon murdered his, uh, murdered his brother because he raped his sister. Absalom then died with his long rebellious hair hanging in the forks, forks of a great oak tree and was murdered by Joab. And when you look at all this mess that takes place, it all started when it says it was the time when kings go forth to battle, but David tarried still at Jerusalem. He... The reason he even saw Bathsheba was because he was not there. The there was the time when kings go forth to battle. He should have been on the front line. If you're in the battle for God and right, stay on the firing line. If you win, then surely, brother, you must fight. Stay on the firing line. And uh, But he was not there. And he turned the devil loose on his family. I don't think parents realize what an unbelievable shield they are for their children and family. The authority of the dad is a great deterrent to satanic attack on 
on the family. And when a dad is holy walking with God and a mother is holy and walking with God, they form a great barrier of defense against spiritual forces. But when your heart is not right and when you as a parent are reneging on what God told you to do and how God told you to live and how God told you to think, I want you to know you turn devils loose on your children. And then you come in crying to the preacher and say, we tried to live for God and look what happened. But there is a reason. There is a reason. Are you there? Is your family there? Let me ask you this question. Are you all the way there? Genesis 31 in verse number 13. And here's what he said. Genesis 31. I am the God of Bethel where thou anointest the pillar, where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now Arise, get thee out from this land and return to the land of thy kindred. So he took off. He was going back. But when you come over to chapter 33 of Genesis in verse 18, and Jacob said to Shalom, a city, uh, Jacob came to Shalom, a city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of a field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money, and he erected there an altar and called it El Elo Israel. And, of course, the, he called it the altar of God, the house of God. He built an altar to impress God that he was where he's supposed to be. Do you realize that he was not... He was there, but he wasn't all the way there. He was in the land of Canaan, but he was not all the way where God wanted him to be. There, he was 30 miles short, 30 miles short of the perfect will of God. Well, we find out just in the next verse, chapter 34, verse 1, Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And then we have a sordid story about how she got involved with the guys and, uh, and, and they defiled her and now they want her as one of the wives of one of their sons. And so they make a, a league with, with her brothers and the brothers sly, slyingly, uh, cunningly agree to kill them all and they did. And Jacob said, you brought trouble on me. You made me stink in the nostrils of the inhabitants of the land. Trouble, 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 because he was not all the way there. Are you all the way there? Are you completely there? And uh, I think now of how uh, I, ha I found this letter. And uh, I was so impressed with the letter. Uh, it was recorded uh, actually, in a religious paper, and it is a letter from a communist boy to his girlfriend, and he's breaking up with her because she is not a communist. And here's, here's the actual letter, and here's what it said. We communists have a high casualty rate. We're the ones who get shot and hung and ridiculed and fired from our jobs and in every other way made as uncomfortable as possible. A certain percentage of us get killed or imprisoned. We live in virtual poverty. We turn back to the party every penny we make above what is absolutely necessary to keep us alive. We communists do not have the time for... Uh, money or for many movies or concerts or T-bone steaks or decent homes or new cars. We've been described as fanatics and we are fanatics. Our lives are dominated by one great overshadowing factor, the struggle for world communism. We have a philosophy of life which no amount of money could buy. We have a cause to fight for, a definite purpose in life. We subordinate our petty personal selves into a great movement of humanity. And if our personal lives seem hard or our egos appear to suffer through subordination to the Communist Party, then we're adequately compensated by the thought that each of us in his small way is contributing to something new and true and better for mankind, and that is is communism. There is one thing in which I'm in dead earnest about, he continues to say here, and that is the communist cause. It is my life, my business, my religion, 
my hobby, my sweetheart, my wife, my mistress, my bread, my meat. I work at it in the daytime, and I dream of it at night. It, its hold grows, not lessens, as time goes on. Therefore, I cannot carry on a friendship, a love affair, or even a conversation without relating it to this force which both drives and guides my life. I evaluate people and looks and ideas and actions according to how they affect the uh, communist cause and by their attitude award it. I've already been in jail for my ideals and if necessary I'm ready to go before a fire, firing squad and with that he signed off and broke off with the girl because she was not uh, willing to follow the line of the devout communist. I'm jealous for the Lord my God when people like that give their lives to a cause that's a lie and will lead them in the wrong direction. I'm jealous for the Lord my God to see young men and young ladies and mamas and daddies rising up and saying, I love the Lord at least as much as that communist loves the communist party. Are you there? Are you all the way there? All the way there. Um, I'm thinking now, uh, are you, by the way, have you left there? In Genesis 35, in verse number 2, we read these words. Um, Genesis 35, verse number 2. I'll find it here. He says, um, And God said to Jacob, Arise and go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar. He said, I've been there. I remember being there, but I'm not there now. I've left there. Uh, is there a time in your life when you know that your heart was on fire for God? You were sold out to him. He, there was nothing in this world that moved you or meant anything to you any more than the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for him. You've understood the great graces of God. You've understood the power of prayer. You've understood the miracles in your life when you submitted to him, but it's been a long time ago and you have left there. B.B. McKinney wrote in his song Back to Bethel these words, back to the joy life my song, soul longs to know, back where the river's sweet waters flow, back to the true life my soul longs to know, Bethel is calling and I must go. And uh, what an what a, what a indictment upon us if we've left our Bethel, our place where God met with us and we made some holy vows to him and he came and met with us. The prodigal found home where the party was that he sought to have but could never find out there. He found friends that were permanent friends and a mom and dad that loved him. You know, have you left there? William Grady uh, was once editor of the Atlanta Journal, and he was one night at a Christian convention there in Atlanta, and they called on him to pray. He was a Christian man, and they called on him to pray. And he looked up and said, no. And um, they said, Mr. Grady, would you come up and pray? He said, no, no, and he dropped his head and refused. They called on somebody else to pray. He was embarrassed. The people that called on him to pray was embarrassed. And the next morning, he placed a call to the head of that meeting. And I've got here what he actually said. He said, gentlemen, I apologize for last night. I'm sorry for what I did, but I couldn't help it. My mother led me to the Lord many years ago. I'm a child of God. I believe in what you're doing, but I'm not in fellowship with God. I've been so busy making money and running a paper and traveling all over the country that I've lost my contact with God. I've stopped going to church. I've stopped reading my Bible. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but I am out of fellowship with God. The next morning, he walked in the Atlanta Journal and announced to the workers that he would be gone. He didn't know how long he would be gone. It may be a day. It may be several days. But he uh, gave assignments to everybody so they would carry on the work. 
till he got back. He got in his car and rose, drove some 80-some miles away to Rome, Georgia, where he grew up. He parked his car at the edge of town, and he walked through that small town down to the house where he grew up, where his daddy now had passed away, and his mother lived there alone. He rarely got to see her anymore. He was so busy, and she greeted him at the door, was thrilled that he came, and he said, Mom, I need to stay with you for a little while. Told his wife what he was going to do. He said, I need to stay with you for a little while. Well, she said, I'd be thrilled. And he said, Mom, I want us to do what we used to do when I was a boy growing up. I want us to pray at the table. I want us to thank God for the food. I want you to read the Bible to me again like you used to. As a matter of fact, Mom, as silly as it sounds, I want you to tuck me in bed at night, and I want you to have prayer over me like you used to do. For two weeks, he stayed there. They sat at the table and talked about the things of God. They read the Bible together. They reminisced about old days. And he told how he remembered so many things that she taught him and we used to say. And at the end of two weeks, he said, Mom, I'm ready to go now. I'm ready to go back. And he left and he went back. And witnesses said that he became one of the greatest speakers in the nation and was used in a mighty way. He had to come home. He had been there, but he had left. You know, when I was grown, my dad, who got saved when he was 15 years old, my dad told me a story that I did not know. My dad said, Larry, I was 15 years old, the Great Depression in the 30s. And he said, it, we were poor, and he said, if we hadn't raised our food out on the farm, we'd have starved to death. He said, in the nearby little town seven miles away, people were standing in, in soup lines to get a bowl of soup to stay alive. And he said, we, we raised our food. We had our own hogs and smokehouse hanging full of hams and, and, and we canned stuff. And he said, you know, we'd haul a load of stuff on Saturday uptown and daddy would sell the produce as much as he could. And then he said he'd just give the rest away because people were in such need. But he said, you know, he said, to get a quarter you could not. And he said, I wore overalls that had patches on top of patches and he said I got discouraged he said he said Larry and he began to cry and he said Larry I hate to tell you this but I just felt like my life was coming down to nothing and he said I did what I shouldn't have done I ran away from home he said I didn't run away with a girl I didn't run away in rebellion I wasn't mad at anybody I, I didn't have any problems with my parents or my family and he said, I knew my daddy wouldn't let me leave at that age, but I just felt like I had to run away. And he jumped a train. And it's some long story I won't get into, but some men were going to kill him, I guess. And he jumped off the train, about got killed, jumping off the train. Ended up in a distant town. He had nothing. He had nothing to leave on. And he was trying to make his way. How Aunt Daisy ever found out where he was, I do not know. My Aunt Daisy died a couple of years ago at age 99. She was a wonderful Christian till she died, uh, Daisy Briggs. And um, uh, my daddy said one day he got a letter from Aunt Daisy. And I, I remember him weeping as he told me what the letter said. And I'd give anything if I had a copy of it right now. But here's what it said, James... Uh, this is Daisy, your oldest sister. And I'm writing to let you know that we're aware of the fact that you've chosen your way and there's nothing we can do about it. And we want you to know we're not going to try to do anything about it. But we just wrote to let you know that the old home place is not what it used to be since you left. He said... Mama, she said, Mama cries every night. Dad is sad. Daddy don't say much. Daddy's awful quiet. He said, we, she said, we go about our, our daily activities very quietly. It's, we try not to talk about it any more than we can, but it's just a heaviness on all of us. She said, the place is not what it was, James. And she said, I know you've chosen your way. But she said, I'm writing this letter to let you know that your sister, Daisy, loves you. And it would, I would be so happy if you decide to come home. And my daddy said, that's what it took. I broke right then. And he said, I went home. 
And my daddy told me that story. My heart was stirred. My heart was warm. And I think about how many, many people have left home. It was Joe De, De Quadro who wrote this song. You came into the family through Jesus' precious blood. You tasted of his goodness and his love. He showered you with blessings. He's building you a home. But somewhere on your journey, you're standing all alone. Come home. Your father really loves you. You've wandered far from the homeland down past so dark and cold in search of all the pleasures you could hold. Your freedom brought you bondage. Rebellion brought you fear. But Jesus stands behind you and the homeland is so near. Come home. Come home. Remember how it used to be when fellowship was sweet, the time well spent in worship at his feet. You know it really doesn't matter how long you've been away. Just let his spirit cleanse you and be restored today. Come home. Come home. Your father really loves you. Come home. Come home. It's where you want to be. It's a place of peace and comfort, a shelter from the storm. Don't wait another moment. Come home. Home is the there that God has prepared for you. Are you there? We've got several visiting prospective college students in this room right now. And this man sitting on the platform would be the last man to tell you this is the only good college in the world. He'd be the last man to tell you if you didn't come here, you wouldn't be in the will of God. He, he would be against anybody that would say that. You must find the there that God wants you in. But most young people find their mates at college, at a good Christian college when they go. And I'll tell you this right now. There is only one for each of you. There's only one for you, and you will never find them in just any college. You will only find them in the college God leads you to. It is the there that God will bless you. Are you there? Parents, are you there? Do you have enough courage and fortitude to rise up and lead your family there and to let your family know this is where we belong? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, the servant of God said. Uh, will you say that? I, I was lost and got saved at Piedmont Bible College in Winston-Salem uh, 58 years ago. And... Uh, I was lost, and my pastor had recommended Bible college because I had professed to be saved. And uh, I was filling out an application to go to Piedmont, which in those days was a pretty good college. Um, and um, so I went over to get my physical. I had to have a physical, and D Dr. Crescenzo met with me. And uh, Dr. Crescenzo was a Presbyterian. And uh, he said, so you're going to Bible college? I said, yes, sir. He was our family doctor. And he said, now, where are you going? I said, Piedmont Bible College. He whirled around and said, what are you going to do in life? I said, well, I think I want to be a preacher. I always felt led to preach, though I wasn't saved. And um, he said, son, look, if you're going to be a preacher, you need to go to the big college. Uh, you, you don't want to waste your time in a small. He said, you see these doctor's degrees on the wall? Though they don't heal anyone, when people come in here and see those big degrees, they know that I'm qualified to treat them as a doctor. You need the big degrees on the wall from the big college. He said, you're standing in the shadow of Wake Forest College right over here. He said, what you need to do is go to Wake Forest College. He picked up the telephone and uh, he called Donald Myers at the First Baptist Church, who was a graduate of of Wake Forest in those days. And he said, I'm sending a student over to you. He said, I can't convince him to be a Presbyterian, so I'm sending him over to you, and I want you to convince him to go to Wake Forest. And so I drove over and met with Mr. Myers, and he was far less persuasive than my family doctor had been and told me that I just need to seek the will of God. I'm so thankful he said that. But I went back to my daddy, who had a seventh grade education, and I, said, I told him what he said. And I said, Dad, I, I want to do the right thing. Thing. What do you think? And my daddy said, son, I just only went past the seventh grade. And he said, I, I'm, I don't know much about education. I don't know much about colleges at all. But he said, it just hits me that some way, somehow, that little small college you were going to go to would be your better go. He said, I don't know. He, he wasn't pushy, but he said, I just feel like some way, somehow, it would be. And I had enough respect for my daddy to 
feel if God led him that way, that's what I would do. Little did I know at that time they were already denying the virgin birth in the religious department at Wake Forest. Little did I know at that time they were laughing at the miracles of the Bible. They had students that were appearing in Playboy, women's students in Playboy magazine. Little did I know that my fa I was lost. I didn't know the Lord. Can you imagine who I'd be? Can you imagine where I'd be if I that put my mind under that kind of an influence? A lost man. But thank God I was in the there of God's life. There, right with God, right with my parents right with the Bible, right with the will of God for my life. Are you there? Are you there? Are you there? Let's bow our heads and pray. I could go on and on preaching, but there is a there. There is a there for you. And I cannot answer the question, but I'll ask the question, are you there? Parents, are you there? Is your family there? Are you all the way there? Have you been there, but you have left there? How about it, young people? How about you? Are you there? Are you all the way there? Have you left there? Are you so, as sold out to God as that young communist boy was for communism? Nobody, but nobody ought to be more sold out to communism or atheism than, they, than we as God's children are to Christianity. Nobody, nobody, nowhere. Are you there? Are you there? I want to ask a question. This will be a sobering question. This will be a question that you'll have to ponder a little bit. And here's the question, and here's the question, are you there? Are you all the way there? Or maybe have you left there? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, think about that a little bit. Now I want to ask the question, if you are there, with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you are there, say, Pastor Brown, I'm not perfect, but as far as I can tell, I am there, and I'm all the way there. Get your hands up, hold them up all over the room, hold them up, hold them up. Well, thank you. You can take your hands down. Pastor, that could have been half of the crowd. I doubt it, but it could have been. That is a scary, scary thought, if you stop and think, that a significant part of this congregation cannot raise their hand and say, I am there. I am all the way there. Boy, I'm telling you, you're talking about scary if I didn't think I was there tonight, if I didn't think I was in the perfect there for God's, for the will of God in my life, brother, I'd stop this invitation right at this moment. I'd have Dr. Sexton come. I'd drop down on this altar and ask God to have mercy on me. I'd be afraid. I'd be afraid to go to where I'm staying tonight, afraid I'd have a heart attack before daylight and God would take me out of this because he warned me to be in the there of my life. Are you there? Are you there? There's people in this room that should join this church. It's the there for your life. I'm not saying everyone should, but there's people in this room that should. There's young people in this room that should go to this college. I'm not saying everyone should, but for some of you, it is the there of your life. And by the way, if you're visiting this week, you're going to be touring, why don't you pray now, Lord, if this is the there for my life, let me know it. Let me know it. Lead me, Lord. Let me know it. And you, you parents need to pray for your children. Give them what guidance you can. My daddy never forced me to go to any college and never stopped me from going to any college. He would have if he had known as much as we found out later about the colleges that I was suggested to go to. But my daddy led me and I had enough spiritual discernment even as a lost boy to follow my daddy until I got saved. And then when I got saved, uh, I valued his wisdom in my life until he went to be with the Lord at age 80. And I'm speaking to parents, and for some reason, somehow, you have failed to put your family there. Get verbal. Your children need to hear you say something about the will of God for yourself and your family and for them. Are you there? Now, how many of you said, I didn't raise my hand that time, but I ought to raise it now and say, pray for me. I'm not, I'm, we're talking about a good choir members and special music singers and school teachers and bus runners and ushers, as well as the average layman on the pew. We're talking to everybody. We're talking to young preachers and everybody. How many are in this room say, I couldn't raise my hand a while ago, but I want you to pray for me. I want to get in the there of my life, the perfect will of God, the place where God promised to sustain me and bless me, and he won't 
won't follow me around with his blessings. He will, he's got a place where I can be blessed. I can go there and get in it or I can do without, but it's there where I will be blessed and fed and led. How many are in this room to say, God spoke to my heart tonight while you were preaching? I need to be there. Raise your hand. Hold it up. All over the room. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up high. I, 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 see, I see 50 or 75 in the front part of the auditorium. I don't see anything in the back part. What's going on here? What's, now I see hands in the back. Slip up your hand. If God spoke to you, I need to be in the there. God bless you. I see those hands. I wonder how many folks are here tonight. You say, I do not know for sure if I died this moment, I would go to heaven. I'll tell you one thing. There's one place for everyone that is lost, and that's the foot of the cross. Asking the Lord Jesus to become your Savior, trusting him as your Lord and Savior. Asking him to come into your heart and believing on him tonight. It is there. Jesus didn't say there are many ways. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Are you there? Are you there covered by grace? Do you know of a time and a place in your life where you ask the Lord to come into your heart? Well, if you did not, would you raise your hand right now? I'll pray for you. Slip it up all over the room. Hold it up. Hold it up. When I see it, I, you may take it down real quickly. I can't see everybody, but... Uh, you raise your hand, we'll see. I'm going to pray. And when I get done, I'll have you keep your heads bowed and eyes closed for at least the first part of the invitation. And I'll give a signal to our pianist. And when I do, she'll begin to play. And when she gets, begins to play, I want everybody in the room to stand up to make it easier for others to get out. And I want all of those who just raised their hand and a whole bunch that should have, I want you to make your way to the nearest aisle and come down here and find a place of prayer and say by that, I want to move over into the there of God's perfect will for my life. And I'll tell you, you will never be sorry. You'll never be sorry. It's the only place of safety, of God's power, of God's provision. It's the only place for you tonight, Holy Ghost of God, working this invitation. Lord, I've done what I could. I, I did the best I knew. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll bless in the invitation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. Work now in a great and wonderful way. And may everyone who raised their hand, and many who did not, may they come and kneel at the altar and talk to God and say, I want to move into the there of my life. Whatever it takes, whatever it involves, whatever I have to do, that's what I'll do. And I pray, Lord Jesus, you'd bless us tonight in that way. In Jesus' name, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Begin to play the instrument. Everybody stand. You hear the music and you raised your hand. Why don't you come right now? From the right to the left. That's right. God bless you. How about it? Just slip out and come. From the right to the left, from the middle to the back, from the front to the outside. Let the Lord have his way in your life every day. There's no joy. There's no peace till the Lord has his way. Put your life in his hand and follow his command. Let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. Amen and amen. They're still coming. That's wonderful. How about others? Will you slip out now? That's wonderful. They're still coming from the back to the front, from the middle to the outside. Let the Lord lead you tonight. Move over into the there of your life. There is a perfect will. There is a place where you will be blessed. And no other place, no other place. Couples coming together. Young couples coming. Parents coming young people coming, children coming. Will you come? Sing the words. There is a place of quiet rest near the heart of God. Let's sing it. 
as a testimony of God's work in our lives. you look this way please if there really is a place a there if there really is a place where God can bless you take care of you find the rest and the provision that only he can give I certainly want to be in it, don't you? And there is a place. All of us could tell stories. I'm not going to tell mine, but I was in the happiest place in my life. I was in the ideal place. 11 miles from New York City enjoying everything God gave me to do. And the Lord said, I have a place for you. Well, I'll bless where I'll bless and provide. I found that. I found that here. I appreciate this. You know, it's about emphasizing the things that God emphasizes. appreciate Brother Larry. I couldn't help but listen to him. I want to be there. I still want to be there. Amen. And Father, bless the dear people who are here who are seeking after thee. Guide them. Guide them by your spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Thank you. You may be seated. I said, play through a verse of this. If you wish to return to your seat, you may. I have something I want to show you. I think they have at the back of the auditorium. Is that correct? People will be back there now, right now. Good. I heard Brother Brown bring a message on submission causes submission years ago. And the Lord used it in my life. And now it's in print. You 
may want to get several copies of it. You're trying to know how to win the battle in marriage, home, family, in church, pastoring, submission. Submission. Tried to find the, the mind of God, know God's way in life. Submission. He said something. You can either live by force or live by faith. You can try to make it happen or find the secret of yielding to God and the Lord bring it to pass. I hope you'll get a copy of the book. It's available for you at the back of the auditorium. We put it there so it'd be convenient. Let's stand together, may we? We've just begun our new Bible study in the Sunday school hour of the book of Ezra. And uh, we've made this available for you. You may want to get a copy of it. I hope you'll do that. I hope your appetite for it has been stirred by the Bible teaching Sunday school hour today. The book by Brother Brown is normally $5.95, $10 or more, four, 10 books or more, get them $4.95. But why don't you just leave $5 and we'll take care of the rest and then get a copy of it for the people there to help you. What a grand day the Lord's given us. Praise the Lord. It's been refreshing to me. And you know, when you help the pastor, you help everybody in the church. And Brother Brown and his wife have helped me. He speaks in our school chapel. We don't say much about it in here because two totally different things. But you pray for him. You can hear him online tomorrow. You can visit with us at 9.45 in the morning at the college chapel. I want to thank you so much for being a part of this. Wasn't this a blessing? Some people just have a way of saying it, don't they? And he has the way. God is using him in a special way. Keep praying for his ministry. I'm going to ask Brother Brown to do something, to stand down here near the front. Some of you wanted to see him and didn't get a chance to do that earlier. So I'll ask his dear wife to come over with him, stand here near the front. Very good. Tell him how much we appreciate him being here with us. Brother Luanz, I want you to come lead us in our prayer, will you? Now, you've got a special project going on. You've all been printing Christian literature, printing the Bible, getting it out to people around the world. And uh, you've got a special project going on right now, right? Yes, sir. And uh, in the most needy area. And what is it? It's a million uh, scriptures to Ukraine in the Ukrainian language. That's wonderful. That's a lot of, that's a lot of printing. Yes, sir. Good. How long y'all been at it? 54 years this September. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Your dad's with the Lord now. I appreciate you carrying it on. Amen, thank you. Uh, I want you to lead us in our prayer and we'll be praying for you. Let's pray together. Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for just your goodness and allowing us to come to the house of God and to worship you and to learn about you, Lord. We're so truly indebted to you. Lord, I ask you that you would bless this great church, bless Pastor Sexton and all the people, all the college students, Lord. Lord, I ask you to keep us safe as we travel home. Lord, forgive us of where we failed you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. God bless you as you go.